In today's episode of The Insect Hunter, we're going to talk about exotic insect pets. Are they legal in the United States? We'll discuss that and we'll also talk about what it is you need to do to have them. Let's find out. The purpose of this episode is to educate you and make you aware of different laws in regarding to insects, especially in the United States, and having them as pets. I'm not trying to offer legal advice in any way, so I have to give that disclaimer. If you need legal advice or need to know exactly what you need to do, then you need to contact the appropriate agency associated with the insects you may be transporting or trying to keep as a pet. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about different government agencies involved with getting a permit for insects like these. Then I'm going to talk with you about when you actually need a permit, why you need a permit, and how you actually get a permit. What is the process like? What are you going to have to do in order to have these legally? First off, let's talk about the main government organizations that are involved in this process. I'm mostly going to talk about the USDA and APHIS. The USDA is a government organization that mostly is focused on supporting agriculture, natural resources, and it carries out some other functions too. One of the agencies that exists within the USDA is APHIS, which is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. One of the purposes of APHIS is to protect plants, food, natural resources, agriculture, all sorts of things around us. They're trying to protect that. That is their purpose and they do this through inspections and other things that they carry out. The permit that I had to get from APHIS is this one here which is called a PPQ permit. It's a plant protection and quarantine permit. The purpose of this permit is to assess risks of different insects or other organisms that enter the United States and what kind of risks they may pose to agriculture or other natural resources. So this is the type of permit that you will likely need. So let's first talk about when you actually need a permit and when you don't. It's easier to explain the exceptions than it is to explain uh, the actual rule itself. And this information that I'm sharing with you came from one of the head entomologists working with the APHIS um, PPQ program. The first exception is tarantulas. I know they aren't insects, but a lot of you probably need to know this because you have tarantulas as pets. You do not need a PPQ permit for a tarantula as long as it was purchased or transferred somewhere within the United States. If you get one from out of the country, you do not need a PPQ permit either but you will need a U.S. Fish and Wildlife permit for importing that from another country. So that's a totally separate permit. I haven't even messed with that. You'll have to check with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife on how to actually import one from a completely different country. But if it's raised here in the U.S. and it's a tarantula, you're good. You can have that up to this point without any issues with APHIS. The second exception is most cockroach species. So for example, like my Madagascar hissing cockroaches, there's no special permit required for those. If I imported them from Madagascar, I may need a U.S. Fish and Wildlife import permit because I'm bringing them from out of the country, but if I'm doing it domestically, there's no issue with that. Um, I don't need any special permit in order to have them. The third exception is if you capture a native insect within the state that you're living in, so I'm in Idaho, so if I capture a Mormon cricket here in Idaho and I want to house that and keep it as a pet, I don't need any special permit, I don't need a PPQ permit, anything, even if it's a pest, because Mormon crickets are a pest. But the second that I try to go to Utah and get a Mormon cricket and bring it here to Idaho, now I do need a permit. So anything caught within the state that you live and is not transferred from another state, you do not need a PPQ permit. Um, but the PPQ permit is going to try and regulate and keep you from moving things across state lines and really check to make sure you're not moving stuff that could be harmful. Now, if I wanted to go to Utah and get a Mormon cricket and bring it up here to Idaho, I could do a PPQ permit and they'll probably approve it easily because they know that I'm not going to cause some crazy infestation since Mormon crickets are both in Idaho and Utah. But at the same time, um, that's good to know for those of you that are collecting insects, anything you collect within your state, um, you can keep as a pet. Obviously, 
if it's an endangered species, then that's totally different. So let's start by talking about some things that do need a permit. First off, I'll talk about mantises. I know that mantises are a big insect pet. There's lots of websites that will sell them online. Even if they are purchased domestically, which means in the United States, you still need a PPQ permit. Now, they're not feeding on plants and they're not going out and destroying crops, but they can affect ecosystems and spreading these insects and getting them established in areas where they shouldn't be could cause some issues. So you do need a PPQ permit for basically whatever kind of mantis you're working with, unless it's native to the state that you're living in and you're not moving it across state lines, then you're fine. But most of these exotic mantises like orchid mantids or ghost mantids, I don't know all the names, uh, they're all coming from out of the country and they're exotic. They don't actually live here in the United States. So you've got to have a permit for those in order to have them legally. Another group of insects is stick insects, which you've seen, I've got my stick insects. The huge issue with stick insects and the reason they need to be regulated and tracked and we need to know and make sure people understand what they're doing is that if they escape, they can reproduce asexually. All of mine here in the boxes that I have, um, they're all females and they just will keep reproducing. That's how I keep this colony alive is they'll just keep laying eggs. I keep the eggs alive and uh, if they got out and loose, they can establish which has happened in the past and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Another group of insects is caterpillars and butterflies. You can't just move those across state lines or have those um, unless you actually collected it in the state or purchased it in the state um, and then you are you know keeping it in the state. So if I bought some caterpillars from someone in the northern part of Idaho and they sent them down here to southern Idaho, the southern part of Idaho, if they are native to here, cool, I can have them. If they're not, I still have to have a PPQ permit. Another group of insects is bees because they're pollinators and they could disrupt certain groups of other insects and affect plants in ways that we're not quite sure. So that's another regulated group in which you'd need a PPQ permit. Also different ant species and uh, yeah, it's basically everything. And I know you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, um, I, I didn't know this, I don't understand this. Why are they being so strict? The purpose of all of this is to protect plants and to try and keep people from just moving things around without actually knowing what they're doing. If you know what you're doing and you have good, strong, sturdy containers and you're containing them properly and you're treating them properly, you're most likely gonna get a permit as long as you're not handling something that's super dangerous or that's high risk. Because, you know, a lot of these things, if you contain them, nothing's gonna happen. But they want to make sure that you understand and know how to contain these insects and keep track of them. So in general, what are the insects that apply to this? If I didn't say the exceptions, it's just about everything else because anything you know that feeds on plants or that's a predator or that affects plants or interacts with plants in any way really is under the PPQ permit system. It needs to have a permit. It's not like they're trying to shut you down. They're just trying to really keep track of what types of insects people are moving around so that they know what's going on so what does it take to get these permits? My permit was free. I got an educational use permit, but there's also commercial permits. I'm not sure if they cost money, but if you're just keeping them at your house to educate people and uh, that's kind of a personal pet and things, I don't think there's gonna be a charge for it. Um, don't quote me on that, but mine was free because I said it was educational use, uh, which you could probably make the case for. You know, you say, hey, well, every once in a while I go to insect expos or reptile shows, and I show them to people and I teach people. So you could probably get an educational use permit that way by making a case. So why would you want to do this? I already talked about the scare factor of saying, well, it's not like they're trying to shut you down and all these things. You know, their purpose is to just protect plants and try to understand what's going on with these movements of these insects and know what's happening. And really it's to educate people and make sure you know what you're doing when you have these insects. When you have these, you're responsible for them, whether you know it or not, whether you have the permit or not. So if you have exotic insects and one of them gets out and they're able to prove that it came from you, you could be legally liable for that. But if you get this permit, it's gonna help you tell you exactly how to house these insects, how to transport them, what to do with them, what not to do with them. That way then you're gonna be protected. Really to me, it's more of this educational thing, understanding what am I supposed to do with these insects that I have as pets and how am I supposed to treat them to make sure I'm not spreading them into 
farmers' fields, and then they're taking over and causing issues. That's the purpose of the whole thing. So really, it's to protect yourself. It's given me a peace of mind knowing that I have the permit for this, and nobody can question this, not my employers or other people. I, I, it gives me a sound mind knowing that I have the right permits. So if anybody ever came and asked, I could say, hey, here's my PPQ permit for these insects. I know that they are... Um, they could be harmful to plants, but I have a permit and I'm following this protocol and uh, that's what I do. So another reason why is because we want to protect our country and also help the environment. So in California, there was a case where the Indian walking stick, which is a, an exotic insect pet, they got out and now they have established there and they're causing problems. They feed on, I believe it's over 500 different plant species. So now these are feeding on things at people's houses. It's affecting the environment. What are they doing? You know, this was caused by humans. We need to try and prevent this. If everybody had permits and they were actually following containment procedures, keeping them in good containers, then this wouldn't have happened. So all of us that want to try and actually keep insects properly and not just do it recklessly, we lose that the more that people just willy-nilly are doing this without actually following containment procedures. So we need to actually have some sort of guidance and follow that and work together on this. So another reason why you should do this is because not only the legal protection of you know losing your job or something or having legal consequences, but also the money. There are fees that are associated um, with housing insects illegally. Now, Truth be told, I have never heard of somebody getting hunted down and then getting charged a huge fee for having insects. But could it happen? Yes, legally they could. And you're not going to have hardly any protection because that's what the law says is that you're not supposed to do this. So if you already have some, I would say you need to get one of these permits um, just to protect yourself in case something changes. You know, a change could happen at the USDA and they say, let's switch up our game. Let's do more enforcement. We need to be a lot tighter on this. Anybody that doesn't have a permit, we're going to shut them down and we're going to charge them these fees. Um, take advantage now while they're not um, enforcing, at least from what I've understood. I, I'm sure enforcement does happen, but take advantage of it. If you have something, start working on the permit process. I, I know of a colleague that had some stick insects and then the USDA somehow found out and then they came to them and they said, okay, you need a permit. You've got to do all this stuff, this paperwork. They didn't get rid of the insects. They didn't take them away. They didn't charge them. They just had to fill out the paperwork once they found out. Now that may continue to happen that way, but I wouldn't bank on it. I would protect myself. If you have insects, I would start filling out the permits and figuring out what you need to do to have the right types of containers and things like that. Like, start working on this process seriously so overall i do think it's worth it to do this and i'm not just saying that because i work for the university and because i need to say it even if i was not working for the university and this was personal it was just me housing this at my house as a as a private um owner i would still get this because it gives me a sound mind knowing i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing i'm a responsible insect caretaker. I'm taking care of them and I'm actually going to follow certain procedures. I'm going to tell people how I take care of them and what I do to prevent them from just getting out because um, recklessness is not going to help out the environment. All right, so let's say you're ready to get a permit. How do you actually do it? What's the process like? That way then you're aware. Um, I'm not going to walk you through everything, but I'll give you an overview. There's two main parts that I remember. The first was an initial submission. So for the initial submission, what I had to do is I had to start filling out this application um, in, the, in the USDA APHIS website. I'll put a link in the description. I had to start going through this application. Before I did the application, I had to go to a USDA site in order to confirm my identity to set up an account to go online and set all this stuff up. So you just go into a USDA office with your driver's license and then they'll confirm your identity and create an account for you basically. Um, that way then you, they, they know who you are. Um, after you do that, um, you will go online and you'll start filling out this application. The application will ask you questions like, 
what type of species are you wanting to house? What are you planning on doing with it? So then you'll go through, so like with my stick insects, I had to say the species name of my stick insects, the two different species I have. And then it asks you, how many adults do you plan on keeping and rearing? How many juveniles do you plan on keeping and rearing? How many eggs do you plan on keeping and rearing, etc. So I went in and filled that out and kind of made some good estimates of about how many I thought I would have. And then they also start asking you questions like, okay, are you gonna be transporting these? Uh, because I have an educational permit, I had to go in there and say, yes, I'm gonna take them around to schools or different areas within the state um, to educate folks about these insects. So I had to go through and do that. In this initial submission form that you'll fill out for the PPQ permit, you're also going to have to talk about your containers, so you'll have to describe it. So I had to describe my containers and what I'd be housing them in, what am I gonna put them in when I'm cleaning the containers, things like that. You also have to talk about how you're gonna transport them and the key thing with transporting these insects is you want to have a double container. That way then in case one of the containers um, opens, there's another container holding them in like this one here. Um, that's what I use to transport these to schools. And they're just wanting you to take extra precautions to make sure you're not um, you know, losing them in your car and then they're flying off or something going into a farmer's field, etc. So those are the big container things you got to do. But they'll also want to know what your location is. Are you raising an insect that feeds on strawberries and is a pest on those and you've got strawberry farms all around you like they're not going to give you that permit because that is a risk they want to know like where are you going to have these is this at your house and then what's around your house is this an urban area and they may also even want to know kind of about um, what the room is you're going to have them in if you're doing a huge large-scale thing um, you need to have them in a locked room or a separate room where they're going to be. But if it's, you know, one little thing of stick insects, um, you know, you could have those in your bedroom. You just say, well, we lock our house or something, you know what I mean, to keep people from coming in. That might be enough um, for what you're doing. But they want to know that. They want to know, like, what are you doing to keep them from getting out or people stealing them and releasing them, etc. And it all depends on how risky the insect is, but they still need to know and understand that you are working to make sure these aren't just getting out. Like your kids aren't playing with them without your strict supervision. My kids do play with them, but I, I, you know, I say that that's under supervision. It's part of the education, you know, letting kids hold them and handle them. And then uh, also they may ask, they'll say, well, how many are you gonna let out at once? You know, if I say, oh, I'm gonna let out 50 at once, you know, they're not gonna prove that because if I have 50 of these things climbing on me, they're not going to, some of them could get away. Like that's not responsible. You've got to actually have a reasonable amount that you're letting out or showing to kids and stuff. So another key part that they'll want to know in this initial submission is how you're going to dispose of their waste um, or just kill them if they're, you know, if you're getting too big of a colony. So like with my stick insects, I have to stick them into my freezer and leave them in there for a couple days. And I think the actual degrees of your freezer makes a difference as well. They want it to be, I think, under zero degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, but don't quote me on that. But it does need to be a very cold freezer to kill them. That's what I use. And I even have to take the materials, like leaves and stuff like that, out of there and put it in the freezer just in case there was an egg in there that could hatch. Um, they don't want me letting those get out and just start hatching, you know, even if it's in the, in the garbage heap somewhere. We don't want them doing that. We want to actually contain them. I also had to include in my permit what I was going to do with the eggs. I had to have a different container, which is what I use, but I had to explain, this is where I'm going to keep the eggs, and this is how I'm going to handle and work with the eggs. They, they want to know that as well. They want to know what you're doing with all the life stages um, of the insects. The second and final part of this whole thing is an inspection. So. Once you've got your submission form filled out, that might go between you and APHIS a couple times back and forth to make sure they're good with what you have. And you'll also need to take a bunch of pictures and send those to them because they'll want to see what kind of containers you're using and such. But then they'll actually send someone to come and inspect. They'll look at your container. They'll look at the insects. They'll look at kind of, they may ask some questions and may take more pictures. Um, but after that, um, I just had to wait a few weeks and then I got an email with a confirmation Then they sent me my permit. So the inspection is kind of the last stage of this whole thing is someone actually coming out physically and checking to make sure you actually are legitimately raising these insects responsibly. So in conclusion, I just want to say, be cautious when you're purchasing insects online, especially here in the United States. 
to make sure you understand the laws associated with moving insects across the state and housing them, especially when they are not native to the state that you're living in. There's so many websites out there selling cool insects and stuff, but they don't really talk to you about these permits and they're probably gonna throw you under the bus. There's probably some clause in, in some hidden part of their website, which I've had a hard time finding on these websites that says, well, if you don't have a PPQ permit, then you assume all legal liability. We assume no liability for that, which they're not. Um, they're assuming that you actually have a permit when they're sending them to you, but they may not even say that because it's too much work for them to say, well, we've got to educate people on how to get these permits and stuff. They wouldn't probably sell as much and it's probably not in their business models, but just be really cautious when you're purchasing insects online that you understand that you need permits for certain types of insects. If it's not on that exception list, like I talked, you need a permit. And I know it's a pain, but I do really believe that it's our responsibility to follow the law and uh, be responsible good folks that are taking care of insects. If not, we're perceived as reckless insect caretakers um, or people raising them, breeders, whatever you want to call us. We, we are perceived as reckless because we just, we don't have any code that we follow. Most of us already have a code, but the government just wants us to follow the same code and make sure we're all being responsible. They want to educate us and uh, have us take care of these insects in a way that will keep our country safe and clean and then also allow us to use them for education. They, they want us to be able to go out and educate people. They are not trying to go out and shut down 12-year-old um, boys that have some stick insects in their house that are really interested in insects. If they, if they found out about that, they'd say, oh, you know, let's, let's help them get the permit. Let's help them stay interested in entomology. We don't want to shut down those desires, but at the same time, they need to know. And that could change if if the USDA decides to change the, the way they're doing things, they could start enforcing. So let's, let's be responsible insect caretakers and fill out these permits and get this work done. Again, in the description of this video, there's a link that will take you to um, the USDA website where you can start working on this permit process in the USA. And uh, I hope you guys will do it. If you have questions, please let me know below. I'd like to hear your questions. Um, if there's reasons you've been hesitant about doing it, then let me know in the comments. If you've done one of these permit processes before, let me know what your experience was working through it. It was a long process, but it's been worth it for me. And I hope you guys will take the chance to like this video if you enjoyed it and learned something. And subscribe to stay tuned next time, where big adventures start small. Thanks for watching.